Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lifeline Church. Thanks for the extra claps in the back there, Chris. I appreciate you. Hey, y'all. Hey, um, if, you know, if you didn't know, my, my name is uh, Mark Meyer. I'm an associate pastor here at Lifeline Church. And hey, we have a mission here at Lifeline. If you know it, would you say it with me? Ready? It's to be a lifeline. That's right. It's by leading people to being lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. So if you uh, noticed, our fearless leaders aren't here with us this morning. Uh, Pastors Elliot and Tiffany Jones are down south. They've been there for the week at a Foursquare convention. Now, you might be thinking like a Foursquare convention, like we played in grade school. No, no, uh, Lifeline Church is actually uh, belongs to Foursquare Church. And so they're down there, hopefully getting refreshed and renewed. And I believe they're going to spend some time down in Disneyland. They got their two youngest kids with them, so we'll see how refreshed they are by the time they get back. <laughs> in fact, yeah, I think, I think they're traveling right now. So, man, aren't our pastor pastors awesome? Can we give it up for our pastors? They're so awesome. I love the way they, they lead us with humility. But, man, they really are seeking God for how uh, the Lord wants to take this church and where, he, where he's leading the church. So we can, uh, we can rest assured that our pastors are taking care of us. So uh, we're uh, in week three of a four-part four series right now called Worship, uh, actually called Closer, and it's all about worship. And so we're going to get into worship today, guys. It's going to be awesome. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I got is from a pastor named Stovall Weems. He's also an author, a uh, pastor down in Florida. And you can also find a lot of his stuff on the Version Bible app, which is really cool. So... Um, As far as scripture goes, uh, the meat and potatoes of what we're going to be in today is Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. So if you have your paper Bible like me, you can turn to that, okay? And uh, one of the main verses in there is verse 33 where Jesus says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so you may have heard that scripture many times. I've heard it many times, read it many times. And uh, it's like Jesus is saying to me, he's saying, if you can just learn what it means to truly put me first and walk in that, all these things, all the things you need, all the stuff you're worried about, he's going to take care of all that. So for the last 18 years of my life as a Christian, I've been learning to walk that out. I've been learning through God's word and through teaching how to actually put that into practice. So uh, if you're there, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, we'll get started. Therefore, I say, do not worry about your life. Really, Jesus? I mean, come on. (laughs) That's a tall order. Don't worry about your life. But can you imagine a life free from worry? I mean, to have that kind of internal peace and security, it's it's a tall order. It's, It's a lot to ask, but it's what Jesus promises us. He promises us that. So I'm going to continue on. Therefore I say, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body for clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, they neither sow nor weep, and gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So what Jesus is saying is, worry will not add anything beneficial to your situation, okay? Worry's not going to do anything good that's going to help you with what you're going through, okay? Pick it up in verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider all the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we, what shall we wear? For all, those thi- for all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things." Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I might gloss over some of these scriptures where 
uh, Jesus is talking about the flowers and the grass and the fields. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I know those verses. Those are cool. Like when you see them in Hobby Lobby on a sign, you know, you know what I'm saying? You're like, oh, that's cute. That's cool. But here's what the God of the universe is trying to say. I mean, Jesus is saying here is that your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Like, that's, that's powerful. He knows our needs. God is so loving. He knows what we need. He knows what you're going through. He knows your pain. He knows your struggle. And he wants to encourage you. He wants to bless you. So verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so we see that all those things will be added to you. Worry can't add anything to your life, but God can. And then 34, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Isn't that the truth? I mean, don't worry, there'll be something else to worry about tomorrow. You know? So we're talking about worship today, guys, right? The foundation of worship, putting God first, or living a God-first life, and how this will allow us to turn our worry into worship. And uh, that's, the, that's the name of the message, message today. It's uh, turn your worry into worship. And uh, it's a simple solution, yes, yet it's so profound to read in God's word that we can do this. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much. I pray for open and hungry hearts as we dive into your word and we learn what it means to uh, have a foundation of worship in our life and the, and the foundation of worship, putting you first. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're going to talk about worship today, guys. We're going to get right into it. But I want to give you just a little bit of a background story real quick about myself. I grew up in a Christian home, got good grades, played sports, you know, I had two great parents that loved me and cared for me. But uh, pretty typical, like, like you've heard or been through, I just wanted to do things that were bad. I don't know why I was so attractive to do bad things, but by the time I was 16 years old, uh, I had been expelled twice from Lodi High and, and had my license taken away, my driver's license. I remember the last time I was in that juvenile court, the judge was just like, man, get out of my face, no license, two years, you're out of here. So I guess you could say I was advanced, maybe, was doing these things pretty, pretty quick. No, but uh, you know, by the time I was 16, I had also uh, graduated from high school, high school diploma, and uh, I guess you could say that uh, it was pretty easy to get credits at the school I was going to, but um, I, I graduated with people, with, with guys with beards as big as mine. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, just, it's just the way it was, you know, but um, by the time I was 17, I guess you could say I kind of grew out of my, my hometown, Lockford, so uh, give it up for Lockford, from Lockford. You heard of Lockford? Uh, yep, that's right. I guess you could say I grew out of uh, Lockford. I, I spent that first winter out of high school, 17 years old, at a ski resort, Sugar Bowl, just living that crazy life up there. But I had goals, I had aspirations, because I was going to come up the next year when I was 18 as an adult and be a lift operator. Because uh, you know, at 17, I was a minor. All I could do was be a, ch a little lowly ticket checker. I was going to come up next year. I was going to be a lift operator, right? Well, I, I came up the next year, I, I wasn't a lift operator, but uh, I brought my, my lovely wife up with me, who was my girlfriend at the time, and uh, we just kept living that crazy life together, and uh, came home from there, kept, kept on that path, you know, into our mid-20s, and, um, and we, we grew up in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, we went down an even, even uh, darker path, you know, and... Uh, even though it looked like on the outside, you know, because we were far from God. We were. And it looked like we were far from God. But I tell you what, uh, God was doing something on the inside. No matter what it looked like on the outside, God was doing on the in something on the inside. And eventually we came to this church where uh, God drew us into his love. And, and as he proved himself faithful over and over, we've given our life more and more to him. And uh, it's, it's a process, people. I'm telling you, it's a process. But... Uh, I say all that just to encourage you because I'm sure that you have people that you're praying for, people that you care for, you care for and uh, they may be far from God. And, and on the outside, it looks like they're far from God. But uh, I want to tell you 
no matter what it looks like on the outside, you keep praying for those people. Because I'm telling you, God, he's going to be doing something on the inside. So let's truly believe that they're going to have an encounter with the one true living God. Come on, I'm, I'm living proof, okay? And uh, God is so good because, you know, when Serena and I first started coming to this church, we were rough around the edges. I, I know Naoma, Janice, they were here. We were rough around the edges. And, and we're still rough around the edges. We're from Lockford, all right? Give us a, give us a break, all right? And, you know, I don't know why, but uh, I think we can all get this way at times. But uh, I had this idea in my head that um, the perfect life, the worry-free life, was uh, the perfect spouse, uh, the perfect job, plenty of money, big house, perfect kids, right, that never got in trouble. But if we go back to verse 33, we see that Jesus sets this all straight. He says, but first, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You see, happiness is not an issue of needs being met. It's an issue of order, okay? Jesus is saying if we will put God first and restore his order in our lives, all those needs that we're searching for will be met. When order is restored, blessing is released. If you're taking notes, when order is restored, blessing is released. And as, we, and as we start to live out this God-first life, and we begin to put into practice his divine order, where order is restored, blessing is released, and then that blessing is a byproduct of a God-first life. So uh, when we pray, a lot of times, what are we asking for? We're asking for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. You know, but we see in, in Galatians that those are fruits of the Spirit, Right? And so um, as we put God first, we're not necessarily having to pray for these things. They're just going to be a byproduct of who we are. They're just going to come out of us. And if you look at all the different stories in the Bible, you see that uh, God restores order so that blessing can be released. It started with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? Everything's going fine, but then they sin, and God has to come in and restore order so the blessing can be released. And it, and it goes this way all throughout the Old Testament. And then the fulfillment of all this is when God sent his son to die on a cross for the sins of all mankind, right? Jesus Christ, the one who is Lord of heaven and earth, the one who rules over all things, the one who we were created by and the one who we were created for. And I'm telling you, if Jesus is truly the Lord of your life, you will overflow with the blessings of God, okay? Amen. I'm telling you. So let's unpack this verse 33, okay, a little bit more. Let's put some fresh light on it, some fresh context around it. He says, but first, uh, but seek first the kingdom of God, right? So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hang out in 33 for a while here, all right? The first practical step, okay, Jesus is Lord. Now how do I walk this out? God being first. Now check out what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, you can't seek these things at all. He's saying, just seek me first, okay? It's order. We've got to get these things in the right order. See, he knows what he needs. He knows, he knows what we need. He knows what we want. He's good with that. He's saying, just put me first, okay? Listen, God can bless you so much better than you can bless yourself, you know? And, and we have all this energy that, that we're pouring into worry, right? We're spending it on worry, well, worry cannot add one thing good to your life. But if you can redirect that energy and direct it toward God, God can add to your life in all kinds of ways. You see, we, we've tried worrying, haven't we? And, and what has it gotten us? You know, nothing, right? It's gotten us nowhere, exactly. So let's take all that energy and direct it toward living for God, putting God first, and watch how he will bless your life you will experience the, the peace, the patience, the kindness, and the gentleness. You will have fruit in your life, I promise. So we've got to redirect our energy. I think that's in the notes. Redirect your energy. And that is how you turn worry into worship. All right. Man, you know, because we're such a mess sometimes, aren't we? Our, our minds can just run away with worry. I mean, I was worried about uh, preparing this message, you know? And just, 
it, it comes at you from every angle, you know? So what Jesus is saying is, I don't need any more of your crazy energy. I just need you to take that same energy and redirect it over to me into worship. And if you'll do that, it's, it's an investment where we get the highest return. If, if you guys know about the stock market, reinvest that into worship, and you'll get the highest return every time. I mean, we can just take a look at the scriptures to see what happens when we worship. Psalm 22.3 says that when we worship the Lord, he inhabits the praises of his people. Psalm 16.11, in the Lord's presence is the fullness of joy. Nehemiah 8.10, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. And 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I'll take some of that. All right. Now, regardless of your circumstances or current pain, in Christ, when, tr- when God is truly first, if you turn your worry into worship, he can give you peace, security, and calm in the middle of your storm. No matter what kind of pain you're facing, God can pull you out. He can heal every hurt. Yeah. You might be in the deepest pit, but I'm telling you that you're never too lost, that you can't be found by him. You can't run from God. You, you can't hide from God. But I'm telling you, if you'll take one step toward God, he'll take a hundred more toward you. Amen. He loves you. I'm telling you. So when we, give, when we give God our energy and our worship, we give back so much because he wants us to, check this out, guys. He wants us to experience his love. Okay, it's an experience. This is a huge principle with putting God first. It's experiencing the love of God or the atmosphere of God's goodness, walking in the Spirit, walking with the Lord. You see, God loves everybody the same. Christ died for everybody. He, lo- he loves us all with the same kind of love that's beyond comprehension, right? However, us experiencing that love to greater and greater degrees is dependent on us putting God first. He must be first. He can't be second. And you might be thinking, well, does God have some kind of ego trip or something? No, but he knows that for us to be truly happy, we have to be in close relationship with him. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little story just to put this into context just a little bit. Uh, My son, when he was growing up, our house was the crash pad, okay? It was common for us to have like five boys crashed out on the couch, and uh, they all loved to hang out at our place, and I loved that. My, my wife, Serena, and I, we love that. So anytime uh, my son would say, hey, you know, Dad, can I bring some friends over? Yeah, of course. You know, we'd pull out all the stops, you know, get pizza or barbecue, get all the snacks out there, and get the pool tuned up, you know, whatever it took for them to have a good time. Uh, and in fact, just this last Super Bowl, my son, he's, he's 19 now, but uh, we had a Super Bowl party. We had uh, a couple of his friends over. My wife uh, lit a candle, put all the snacks out, you know, cleaned the house and uh, capped it off with a high-quality nacho bar. I'm talking all the fixings, right? Uh, two kinds of meat, carne asada, and that, that red chicken from uh, Rancho San Miguel. You know what I'm talking about? It's fire, right? It's fire. And, you know, when my son was younger, he never asked me, hey, Dad, why do you do all that? Why do you, why do you pull out all the stops? Why do you go through all the trouble? to get all that food ready for us and stuff like that for my friends. And, I, you know, but if, if he did ask me, you know what I'd tell him? I'd tell him, it's just because I love you, son. You know? I have no agenda. I just want you to enjoy our home. I want you to experience the atmosphere and enjoy the life that I've provided for you. And it's the same with Jesus. On only such a higher and deeper level. The word says that you were created for his good pleasure. And that's why when you seek the kingdom of God first, when you come into God's home, God's atmosphere, that's when you begin to enjoy the love of God and the goodness of God. And check it out, guys. That's, that's when you can experience God for yourself. Come on now. How many of you are ready to worship God, huh? It's good. He loves you. He loves you. Come on. All right, so let's transition to the the second part of that. So he talked about um, 
Seek first the kingdom of God and now his righteousness. Seek his righteousness, right? And this is how we're going to establish your identity. That's the, second, uh, that's the third slide there, maybe. Uh, establish your identity. Uh, the definition of righteousness, God's right character or path, okay? This is righteousness. God's right way of doing things. And then the word seek here, where it says seek first, is very interesting. In Greek, it actually means to thoroughly search, to come to a binding agreement or conclusion. So what's it, what this means is, okay, I'm in God's family now. Jesus is first. And I'm going to thoroughly search the word of God to decide my values, the way I'm going to live, who I am in Christ. And I'm going to begin to build my character and who I am in Christ. And I'm going to begin living my life from the inside out. Okay? From the inside out. No longer am I going to be pressured by the culture, by what uh, the outside world is saying, by what people are saying. Uh, from this point forward, I'm coming to a binding conclusion about God, about who I am in Christ, and about the way to live. No longer am I going to be pressured from the outside. No, I'm going to live my life from the inside out. And that's what it means to establish our identity, to establish our identity in Christ. So in this world now, you guys all know, there's a lot of choices, right? We have a lot of choices out there, many, many choices. Um, how about your health plan? Every year it rolls around, open enrollment, you got to redecide, right? Redecide your health plan. Do I need to change anything here? Uh, how about on TV? You turn the TV on, there's a million things to watch on TV, right? There's a million things not to watch on TV too, right? <laughs> uh, how about just going to Walmart to pick, up a, to pick up a toothbrush or something like that? There's a million choices. Now, this is kind of a fun thing. I, I'm going to show of hands. Um, Talking about choices, okay. Your toilet paper roll, do you hang it uh, on the inside or, or on, the, so on the outside? Okay, good. You're all normal people. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, we have a lot of choices, right? Now, I, I came up with that this morning. I'm not going to tell you where I was at, but I, yeah. I check it out. The God first life and putting God first, it's, it's not a moving target. It's not like that. You see, once, what God, once we see what God's word says about any given situation, it's a one-time decision, a binding agreement or conclusion that you make to do it God's way. You make that decision one time, and then you just manage that decision or handle that decision for the rest of your life. Like with salvation. So when I see that God loves me and that I'm not condemned and that all my sins are forgiven... Guess what? I'm not redeciding that every time I mess up, every time I sin. I've decided that once and for all. I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm on my way to heaven. Jesus loves me. And I made that decision one time according to the word of God. I'm going to handle that decision or manage that decision for the rest of my life. I'm not going to live in condemnation and go up and down in my relationship with God anymore. I'm not redeciding that anymore. God is first. And I understand that. I know who I am in Christ. When it comes to our values and the principles of the Word of God, Lifeline has a great way of communicating this as it relates to church life. Uh, the importance of Sunday services, life groups, growth track, and serving on the dream team. Those are all God-first decisions. So we see what God's Word says about the house of God, weekend services, and being faithful to God's house where we can worship and gather and give together, right? I'm making that decision one time to be faithful to God's house. I don't have to re-decide every Sunday based on outside circumstances. No, I'm going to live my life from the inside out, and I'm not going to be pressured by things on the outside. Another value and, and principle of God is tithing. Once I've learned what the Word of God says about tithing, I make that decision one time, and then I just manage that decision for the rest of my life. Once I see the, what the Bible says and that uh, the first 10% belongs to God, that's it. God's first, and he's first in my, fan, my finances. I know that God has called me to trust in him in that, and so I don't have to redecide every Sunday whether I should change my mind on tithing. We see in the word of God that God has called us to be in community. 
Okay, okay, Lord, I got it. Now that God has shown me the importance of gathering together as Christians, I don't have to redecide whether I need to be in community. I don't have to rely on Lifeline Church or Pastor Elliot to pump me up to, you know, convince me to join a life group. No, I see it in the Word of God, and I see that it's important, and I'm going to live my life from the inside out. Also, uh, I'm not redeciding if I need to serve on the dream team, if I need to get into growth track. I'm not redeciding on how to treat my wife or, or my son or anything else like that. No, these are God-first decisions. They're binding agreement or conclusion, a, a decision we make one time, and then you just manage that decision. Now, I believe that the reason why a lot of us believers are up and down in our spirituality is because we're constantly redeciding based on what the outside world is saying. Now, until we say, no, God is first, I'm living my life from the inside out, and as God teaches me, I'm going to make those decisions one time and stick with it. Until we do that, we will struggle to experience the fullness of the blessings that God has for us. Come on, y'all. How many of you are ready to live life from the inside out? Come on. There's God. Uh, I, I had to give you a little chance to respond there. Sorry. Kind of a whirlwind of words. So once we've established our identity, we get to the last part of, of this verse, 40, 33, that we're in. Jesus says, and all these things will be added to you. He's saying, you have me now, right? Jesus is saying, you have me. Now all these things will be added to you. He's saying, I, I want you to enjoy your freedom. Enjoy, like, like the story I told you about my son. I want you to enjoy our house. I want you to enjoy the life I've given you. But to enjoy that life, my house, you have to be in my house. You have to be in my kingdom. I want you to enjoy our life, your life. And here's the awesome thing. When you put God first, you can have all those things, but they won't have you. Man, I got to just say that one more time. When you have all those things, you, I mean, I'm sorry, when you, when you put God first, you can have all those things, but they won't have you. And then a transformation has taken place in your heart and you have the right perspective on those things, now God can bless you so much better than you can bless yourself. God loves you so much. He wants to give you exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ask or think. That's where I'm going to wrap up. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word. I pray that it would, uh, it would just land on, on open and hungry hearts this morning. And so church, I just want to give you an opportunity to respond. There's going to be a an opportunity, two different things. The first is uh, if you feel like you've been worrying too much and you want to get, turn that worry directed into worship, you want to establish your identity in Christ, then I just want to give you a chance right now. Be bold and, and just raise your hand. It's, it's not for me. It's for God. Amen. I see all your hands. And, you know, and something happens when we respond to God. Like in, in Hebrews it says, um, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. And so you're responding to God, and, and he's going to honor that. He's going to help you turn your worry into worship. Now, maybe you're saying this morning, you know, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know Jesus, you know, but, but you want to, and you, and you want to make the decision to believe that uh, Jesus Christ died for your sins, and that he lives, and uh, you want to invite him into your heart. And so if that's you, I just want to give you the opportunity to raise your hand this morning. It's, it's a big commitment, but there you go. I see your hands. Today, you are in the house of God. You are in the kingdom of God. You made that decision. It's a big deal. Praise God. Praise God. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for hearts being turned towards you. And we're just going to continue to turn that worry into worship as we trust in you. Thank you, Lord. Amen.